everybody, and happy Tuesday. Welcome to another uh, hour of good-natured fun. Um, yeah, I, I have to be uh, be upfront with you guys. Um, the um, collection here at Good Natured uh, World Headquarters had gotten a little out of hand. I, you know, I have this terrible habit of just picking things up that kind of catch my eye. Um, here we've got some, uh, this is a sycamore seed ball. Here's a sweet gum uh, fruit. Here's uh, some really cool uh, hazelnuts. Uh, let's just say I didn't have any room to work anymore. So yesterday when our, our computer system went down, I, I took the opportunity to um, tidy up a little bit. So I've actually, uh, I've got my desk uh, workspace back again. Um, and I, I've got a good, grocery bag, uh, paper grocery bag uh, of items that are going to go out and um, uh, rejoin the natural world. I think they're going to go in the compost pile. But um, as I was going through things, I did um, find a couple of things that I don't know if we had talked about before. And if we have, I, it's been quite a while. Uh, one was this collection of goldenrod galls. Um, and we won't get uh, too deep into the the life cycle right now. Just to to briefly recap, uh, these are called by uh, created by uh, an insect called a goldenrod gall fly. Uh, the female lays uh, an egg on the stem of the plant, um, and the uh, chemical reactions um, that ensue as the uh, larvae starts to um, feed cause this gall to form around it. Um, it's a, um, because it's a fly, the, the larva is, is soft bodied. Um, and at that stage it has a, uh, uh, it has chewing mouth parts and it's basically, you know, it, it ends up being surrounded by its favorite food and it spends its, um, the, the immature part of its, uh, of its life, just eating and eating and eating one really essential thing it needs to do is chew an exit tunnel because as an adult, uh, you know, flies, they don't have chewing mouth parts. Um, so they, they, they chew an exit tunnel, they plug it up with um, uh, material, shall we say, frass, poop, um, whatever they happen to have handy. Um, and then uh, when it comes time for them to pupate and then emerge as an adult, all they have to do is crawl out that tunnel and pop that plug out with their head and fly away. So uh, when they develop uh, and emerge on their own, they'll leave um, an exit hole that is almost perfectly round. You can see it up here at the top of this gall. So we know that, that this, uh, this home uh, to the gall fly larva um, successfully produced an adult fly. Uh, there's actually, I read a really interesting article um, a few years ago about the ecology inside a goldenrod gall after the, uh, the fly emerges. There's, there's little um, microbes that will live in there. Um, there's, there's tiny spiders that will go in and feed on some of the tiny other things, little mites and things that get in there. So there's, there's really... Um, endless amounts of smaller and smaller life forms that will use uh, these structures. Um, and, you know, they last for quite a long time, too. They're really obvious right now because of the foliage being down and it being so nice out <laughs> when you're out walking around. Um, you know, keep your eye out for these knobs on, and you plus, you know, it's kind of a two for one. Uh, you'll, you'll identify the plant by this uh, gall. Um, goldenrod galls only occur on goldenrods. Um, and then um, you can also identify the insect that made that. Now, this is, you know, like you said, if, if everything goes well, and you know, we get that, that little round emergence hole there, if um, that development gets interrupted by say, um, oh, like a, maybe a downy woodpecker, then we'll get a hole that looks like this, um, much larger, and it's the result uh, of the animal uh, pecking and going in after that uh, tasty uh, little larva. That one, it looks like they made it all the way in and they were able to extract 
um, the uh, developing uh, larva that was inside. This one, I don't think they did. It doesn't look like it goes all the way through. Um, maybe they they chose the wrong end instead of going in on the side. Maybe you know maybe the um, the uh, tissue is deeper in the gall from the top. So unsuccessful attempt and. Um, this one somebody got a, a little snack out of. So just a little snack by yourself when you're out walking around enjoying this unseasonably warm weather. Um, oh, 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 I know. I've, also, when I was cleaning things off today and uh, yesterday, and I might even do it tomorrow too because there's a lot of stuff here. Um, I came across... Um, this piece here, and we had talked about this a while back. This was uh, an oak branch that had uh, this uh, jelly fungus growing on it. You, you just add water to these and they kind of uh, expand. They're very soft, uh, apparently edible, but not very tasty sort of a fungus. Um, I'd let this one dry out with the intention of someday rehydrating it. I'd still do that. But um, I had it in my, my bag to um, compost with last week's uh, crust uh, fungi and uh, these lichens. And then what did I come across but our old friend, the black light. So I thought it might be kind of fun to see um, if these things glow or not. I've heard that certain uh, types of fungi will, will glow under black light. Um, I've heard that sometimes lichens will produce a cool glow. So um, if you'll bear with me just a second, I will um, I'll go shut the lights off. I've also, uh, <laughs> I've got, uh, you never see it over here, but um, in the window, there's a coleus plant that is growing wildly out of control. Um, I've heard that chlorophyll will fluoresce red under black light. So we'll give that a shot too. Okay, hold on just a minute. Um, I'm gonna go turn the lights up right back. Ooh, oh boy. <laughs> it's a little darker than I thought it was gonna be. Um, all right, let's put our black light on here. You see that? Now let's see, I'm gonna hold it up, the camera and let's start. Uh, it's something easy here. Here is our, gonna work. Mm, okay, so there's the green leaf. And putting uh oh. We put the black light on the green leaf. Uh oh. Well, is the camera picking up? I'm seeing a red leaf, but doggone it, it's not. Um, you guys aren't seeing red, are you? To me, it looks kind of gray on that camera light. Hmm, maybe our great experiment isn't going to work so well after all. Um, this. All right, so this is. Um, ooh, that's the jelly fungus. So what I'm seeing um, is a really cool purple color. You, you, it looks like you guys are seeing just a little bit of the purple there. Um, and then on the uh, bark itself, I'm seeing a bright, uh, bright green. Um, it's looking kind of silver for you guys. All right, let's see what else. Ooh. Now here's an unscheduled step. Let's see how this looks for you. Um, this is the, this is a shell from a, um, a Chinese mystery snail. Yeah, 
Yeah, Valerie's making a good point. Um, I'm having a blast. <laughs> I may continue this after the program is over. Um, um, if you have access to a black light, uh, to give some of these things a try yourself. Um, like uh, Valerie just uh, made a point in the chat that uh, there's something about a camera that doesn't reproduce the same effects as we're seeing in real life. So, all right, you know what? Uh, ooh, <laughs> I'm gonna go turn the lights back on. I'll be right back. Yeah, on these on these warm winter nights, if you've got a black light, maybe uh, maybe take it out with you if you uh, are inclined to go out for a stroll. Um, you might see some pretty cool things that catch your eye. All right, um, what else did I have here? Um, you know, I think that's it for uh, the show and tells for right now. Um, Let's go ahead and uh, switch over to our um, our slides for this evening. Um, again, with the, the weather we've been having, there's been some uh, interesting sites uh, that have popped up um, in the uh, outside world around us. Hold on just a second here, folks, and I will get that uh, pulled up. And there we go. Oh, you know what? Before we do this screen share, um, I'm going to choose a different one here. Uh, besides um, the uh, interesting objects we're going to look at, there was an interesting phenomenon today, too. Uh, Miss Bonnie, I just saw it here as I was uh, starting to do the screen share. I'm gonna pull uh, up this uh, screen and we're gonna go to this. Does everybody see a cut log here? Um, Bonnie was out doing some uh, restoration today, cutting some trees down and look at, look at the drips that are occurring on this log. This is January 10th, and I think we're in the midst of our first sap run of the year. Drip, 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 drip. Um, I've always heard, so, so uh, to get the sap, um, which is the, uh, the water that is going to carry the nutrients up to the leaf buds so that we'll have leaves on our trees come springtime, um, th that phenomenon of the sap running or going up the tree uh, is driven by the temperature gradient that we get usually in late winter or very early spring where we have uh, nights that are below freezing and then we have daytime temperatures that are above freezing, but we're having that right now. So um, uh, there's a lot of movement inside the plant. I was, I, when I was out with the dogs this morning, I felt, boy, you know, it, it, it feels like a March day. Um, whoops, where did that come from? <laughs> Let's go back to the sap running. Um, the uh, um, made me kind of curious. I almost went and dug out a drill and and put a spile in the the silver maple in my backyard. Uh, I had to go to a, a program instead, but um, yeah, it makes me kind of wonder. I'm, I'm really glad I'm not in the the sap business. Um, I don't know, what do you do with a day like this or a week like this or a season like this? What does it mean for the future? We'll see. Um, we'll see what uh, uh, our temperature trends hold. But yeah, the, the sap is definitely moving. Bonnie, thanks for taking that video today. Appreciate that. All right, let's, um, let's go now um, to our slides for this week. Um, let's go ahead and put this in slideshow mode here. Um, there we go. So um, last week we talked about this insect 
And I erroneously, I, I have to say, I led you astray. Uh, I was flat out wrong. I thought this was some sort of a midge. Uh, midges are, um, they look for uh, all the world like uh, mosquitoes, but they don't uh, take blood meals. The females do not need blood in order to produce eggs. Um, this particular insect was a little bit bigger than um, the average midge. So I thought, you know, it must be some sort of, you know, winter hardy species. Well, turns out completely wrong. This is um, a winter crane fly. Um, crane flies, you might recognize um, that name because of these creatures. We see these guys all summer long. Um, the uh, so, um, people tend to see these things and freak out. They think they are giant mosquitoes. Now, mosquitoes and crane flies and midges, they are all part of the order Diptera, which is the, the fly order, uh, DI for two, and then Terra, P. Uh, P-T-E-R-A, diptera, uh, or diptera, uh, means two wings. Um, and unlike our, our dragonflies or beetles or butterflies, you name pretty much every other order has two pairs of wings. These guys only have one pair uh, or just two wings total. Um, to make up for that, um, that pair that's not there, uh, flies, um, mem other members of this order, they have what are called halteres. Um, they are these little structures here. You can just kind of see them. Um, they, they look like dots on the wings, but these are actually two structures that are coming out uh, from the sides of the body. It helps the insect uh, to be able to fly straight. Um, and, um, you know, they're, uh, I've heard them referred to as being vestigial wings as well. Um, so yeah, this is not a midge, it's a crane fly, and yes, it flies in the winter. Um, the If we go out of uh, slideshow mode here, um, in the info box here, uh, I've found out that they're most likely in the uh, genus, Trichocera or Trichocera. Haven't heard it pronounced. I've only read about it. Um, but um, they, uh, I want to take that information out because that's for the next one. Um, there's a few different species, but you have to get up really close. Um, and there's, there's parts of the insect that, um, yeah, they, they really don't appreciate you looking at in order to make that call. So um, we'll just say that it's it's most likely from this particular uh, genus and um, they fly in the wintertime. Now, um, the, um, there is some overlap, especially if we go around the country, there is some overlap in the time that these insects appear. Uh, they overlap with some of the other crane flies uh, that fly around in uh, the non-winter seasons. So how do you tell the difference? Um, I tried to to look on this photo, and while it's it's a, you know it's not bad, but it's not great either. I took this with my cell phone, and we can't zoom in quite enough to see the details on the head. But winter crane flies have three. Uh, little structures called uh, ocelli, which are simple eyes. They've got their two compound eyes too. They've got you know the large eyes, but then they've got these um, uh, light sensing uh, organs up on the top of their head. And there's three of them clustered in between uh, their two compound eyes. Couldn't make it out here, but now I kind of want to go out and look for uh, another one to see if I can maybe use a loop uh, or something to, to get up close and see if I can see those, those other three simple eyes on the top of the head. Um, I'm guessing this is a female. Now, like midges, and midges, again, you know, they, they look like mosquitoes. You've probably encountered them. Um, we'll, we'll see these uh, mating swarms that are made up mostly of males. 
uh, they 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 fly around in these these little clouds and um, they tend to swarm around your head. They'll sometimes get up your you know your in your face in your mouth sometimes um, as they use the the power of of this um, group of males sensing pheromones trying to pick up on a female if one guy senses it the whole lot of them is going to follow him uh, till they they find the females that they're looking for um, this individual was sitting singly on the side um, of this this was a, a utility box that she was perched on um, and there were a couple others, but it didn't see a, a, a cloud of males looking for females uh, that day. But this is the time of year when they are mating. Um, the females, now a lot of our crane flies, if we go um, to our next picture here of the, this is the terrestrial, uh, they, I gave it away. <laughs> the adults that live on land uh, is, um, you know, in this part of their life cycle, but uh, a lot of our crane flies lay their eggs in the water. And the larvae, which can get to be pretty good size, are, are uh, summer flying crane flies. Sometimes their bodies are, you know, well over an inch, sometimes close to two inches long. And their, their larvae get good size too, sometimes uh, as big as your pinky and, and just as juicy. Uh, most of these, again, are living in the water. There's a few that, uh, live in the soil, um, but for the most part, the larvae of um, the summer flying crane flies live in water. The larvae of the winter crane flies live on land, and they're actually, um, from what I've been able to glean, pretty important decomposers. Uh, they're living in the leaf litter, feeding on uh, things helping break down uh, the uh, uh, the leaves that have, uh, you know, come down and returning nutrients into the soil. So uh, neat thing, something that we only see uh, during the cold weather months. So keep an eye out. Um, insects of any type in, in January uh, when you're outside is, are notable, but uh, these, these were, were uh, a, a new and interesting discovery and they are not midges. <laughs> they are, uh, crane fly. Now, um, let's see, let's go to our next one. And, and Valerie, I have to thank you for this. Um, Valerie was walking over at uh, Leroy Oaks last week and I uh, believe was walking with a friend and noticed this little creature here. Um, this is actually another type of crane fly, but um, it's a wingless version. Uh, the thinking with these guys is that um, they are so uh, well adapted to cold temperatures um, that their wings have become useless, so they've just done away with them. This uh, particular uh, genus does not have wings on their bodies anymore. They do still have the haltiers. Um, I was trying to see if we could make them out on the sides of the body. Uh, so those uh, those two little little ball structures on either side uh, have remained, but the actual wings have gone away. Uh, in reading a little bit about their life cycle, uh, I learned that the uh, again this is the time when when they're active and they are uh, seeking mates. The females carry their eggs not in their abdomen. Uh oh not in their abdomen, which is where most females have their reproductive organs, but they use space in their thorax, uh, which would normally be taken up with flight muscles. But since they don't fly, um, they've got this extra extra space. And so she, that's where she stores her eggs at. I thought that was kind of a cool adaptation to this cold weather life. Um, they're sometimes mistaken for spiders because they've got these long, uh, crane like legs, but they are not, there's only six of them. There's not eight. So it's not um, an arachnid. It is an insect. And uh, in um, thinking around, there's a, there's a couple different uh, 
publications that I came across that wrote a lot about uh, crane flies in winter. And then I came across, um, it's over here on the info side of the screen, um, out at the University of Washington, they have uh, a whole uh, web page devoted to research they've done on snowflies. It's called the Snowfly Project. Um, this is uh, one of the fewest, uh, few arthropods, and actually, I think it's possibly the largest arthropod um, that can live in the Arctic. So it, there's, um, there's different species around the globe, but they all tend to hang out in these colder weather climates. Um, pretty cool, huh? Nice find, Valerie, and thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, I threw in, you, you probably saw it here, I threw in one more picture. Um, this is not a current photo. This is from, uh, gosh, I think this was an LFE, learned from the experts class that we did on tracking in 2019. So not a, not a new photo, but um, it was taken on February 3rd. So it's, it's timely in that this is another insect that's active in winter. This is a winter stonefly. Uh, and these guys are, are cool. Um, one, stoneflies are a very primitive insect. Um, they don't have a lot of the bells and whistles that uh, some of our more modern insects have, like say uh, uh, butterflies. Uh, they, they, these guys, they've got uh, their heavily veined wings. They um, have an aquatic uh, nymph that they uh, develop from. They don't have any sound producing structures like our crickets, um, our katydids, our cicadas, but they do communicate um, by sound. They drum, they um, are able to thump. And um, it's not a sound that we can hear uh, with our human ears, but uh, it works really well for these guys. Uh, another thing that makes this insect notable is that they have very uh, little tolerance for pollution. They, they, you know, water gets dirty. If there's not enough dissolved oxygen, you're not going to find stoneflies. And honestly, we, we don't find stoneflies in a lot of um, our streams in Kane County. There's, there's not too many that will still uh, support uh, stoneflies. There's too, there's too much sediment or and the, the dissolved oxygen isn't of the, the high level that these guys require. But the good news is um, Pearson Creek, which has always been very highly rated for its diversity, uh, is still clean enough to support stoneflies. So um, it's, uh, it was a, a cool find. I would imagine that they are, um, they're either out now or they will be coming out soon. Uh, something else to keep an eye out for uh, should you find yourself uh, near a creek, um, near Fearson Creek, especially. Keep an eye out for winter stoneflies. All right, um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, okay, so this is, is staying in the insect uh, mode here for just another slide or two. Um, I was at the Nature Center uh, out at Hickory Knolls the other day and um, our restoration crew came in to have lunch. Uh, what they were working on was the um, uh, removal, uh, it's, a, it's a almost endless job, removing black locusts. Um, black locust is not native to this area and it's, it's pretty invasive. It um, is a nasty tree to deal with too because it's got uh, these thorns or, or spines on the branches uh, that are go right through your gloves. So uh, our crew has been working hard to take these uh, black locust trees down and then um, go back and get the re-sprouts. Uh, it's just a really a continual process in the Hickory Knolls natural area. But anyway, uh, the lunchtime conversation, um, as it so often does, uh, turns to things like rubs and um, Patrick, who's a member, he's one of our restoration ecologists, he said that as he was cutting down this one uh, black locust tree, he felt um, 
he, he could smell, he didn't call them grubs, he called them maggots, <laughs> but um, I'm pretty sure what he was talking about was beetle larvae that were living in these stumps. Well, there's nothing I like better than a, than a good bunch of grubs. So um, yeah, after we finished eating, I went out with the crew to see if I could find, you know, where, uh, where he'd been working, if I could find any more grubs, because um, they're, they're kind of hard to identify when you're not a, a coleopterist, a, a beetle expert, but they are fun to raise. And it's always kind of a surprise then when they, they pupate and they emerge, you get to find out just, you know, what species it was uh, that you, uh, you've been living with. So, and sometimes they take years. I've had some that have taken two uh, over two years to develop into adults. So anyway, I went out there um, and I didn't find any grubs, but look at all of this frass. This was from just one, I peeled off one chunk of bark from one stump. Um, and this was, uh, what we're looking at here is beetle uh, poop, beetle frass. And there was so much of it. Um, don't know because I, I didn't didn't come across any uh, of the actual insects. I did find one um, pupil chamber. So what these guys do when they're when they're feeding, and different types of beetles feed on different parts of uh, of a tree or a dead tree. Um, uh, but when they when they grow to their uh, final instar or size of a uh, as an immature creature, they need to pupate, um, you know, just like a, a moth uh, caterpillar will create a cocoon or a butterfly caterpillar will create a chrysalis. These guys will create a pupil chamber out of um, the uh, uh, mud or frass or, you know, whatever surrounds them, they will um, create like a, a, a almost perfectly round little chamber, a ball looks like a ball of mud, a dried mud. Um, and then they develop inside of that. I found one of those, um, but the creature that was inside was so uh, deteriorated, I, I couldn't make sense of it. It was just all crumbled inside. So um, don't know what we're looking at, but boy, they, they were really busy feeding on those black locusts. Um, here's the... Uh, um, image with the the lip balm for scale but um I, if if I, I left a container with them um, because they're still working on in that area uh this week too um if they find some i will let you know and uh, maybe we'll go down the uh the grub raising journey together all right um this Valerie, i don't know um if you noticed these tracks the other day, uh, this was actually in your driveway. Uh, you had a little kitty cat visitor. Uh, we've got some tracks here. Now here we can see both the uh, the hind and the uh, front foot of the cat. And here the tracks, the feet have come down almost on top of each other, which is uh, what's called direct register where, um, the rear foot will come down and replace where the front foot was. But we can tell it's a cat because there's no sign of any claws. Uh, here the, the tracks are a little bit apart again. Um, and we can see the one, two, three, four toes. And we can see the heel pad. Um, but there is no uh, sign of any claws as cats normally when they're walking, their claws are retracted. Doesn't mean that a cat track can't have claws if they're walking in deep mud or if they're, they're running and they need to grab traction, uh, they might put those claws out. But uh, just kind of a, a fun little track. We haven't had hardly, you know, there's hardly been any snow to, to do any tracking with. So I had to grab the opportunity while it was there, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be getting some again soon and you might be able to put your tracking skills to use. Um, and then um, I'll wrap up the slide part of the, uh, the uh, program tonight with a visit from our old friend, the albino squirrel up on Crane Road. Uh, got this image in yesterday from a, a resident up there. This is a squirrel now, I, if we're, um, 
counting correctly and assuming that this is the same squirrel and nobody's seen any evidence of um, there being more than one of these or if this, you know, this squirrel even reproducing, it doesn't seem to hang out with any other squirrels. This would be year five for this albino squirrel. Uh, I thought it was kind of cool, this picture, um, you know, with the, the little uh, dusting of snow that we did have, uh, the colors actually work in, in, during this season. Now it's been seen uh, spring, summer, and fall as well. And for some reason, it, it's, it's not getting eaten. I would think uh, an animal that doesn't blend in at all <laughs> the way this one does throughout much of the year, uh, would be at a huge dis disadvantage, but um, where it's living at. So it it did earlier in its life, it did appear a time or two over at Primrose Farm. That's the, the part of Crane Road that we're talking about, local people. You can maybe picture um, it's uh, the part of Crane Road that runs north and south, um, uh, south of Volcom Road. But um, it's... Uh, it went a couple of times over, it was seen over at Primrose Farm, but I, I think it's a little too open there. We don't have a lot of trees. The, the neighborhood that's on the, the other side of Crane Road has uh, a lot more cover. Uh, I think there's a lot of houses there that have uh, bird feeders. And um, uh, there's also the, you know, all the, the oak trees that are over there too. So it, it's got plenty to eat. And um, it seems like it's doing doing really well in year five. Now, just for a, a comparison, um, you know, a lot of a lot of squirrels don't survive their first year. Um, if they manage to make it, uh, you know, survival rates are usually they say you know fifty percent maybe for the first year. If they can make it through that first year, uh, then the the average. Um, uh, lifespan is about six. Uh, I think the oldest recorded um, wild living squirrel was about 12. And then in captivity, uh, they can go on from there. I think the record holder is something like 20. But you know, six is about average for, for a normal uh, a squirrel with normal pigments. So this individual, uh, this is just a survivor, you know, it's in year five now. Um, I thought that was a, a nice way to um, welcome 2023 and, um, you know, just be happy for this little guy having, um, having the luck of the albinos. <laughs> All right, um, let me, uh, let's stop the screen share now. All right, and looks like we had one other Another comment here too to get to. Um, oh, Meredith said uh, Funk Scroll website. Um, they map out starting in January uh, what their process is for tap and tubing. So, um, um, so they 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 will start in January. Is that what that means, Meredith? If um, uh, Funks Grove is down uh, downstate. It's in McLean County. Um, it's where a lot of folks go for their um, uh, Illinois-produced um, maple syrup. Um, so, Pam, they have like a whole page on what they do. But in January, they mostly uh, make sure that um, any fallen trees, they take care of that. Uh, branches, uh, repair any tubing. Uh, new taps, so they mostly do repair, getting ready for, it could be anywhere between, uh, it seems like more in the mid-February is when they really go for it. Okay, here, I've, I got it pulled up here. Oh, and I forgot, yeah, um, yeah I visited there for the first time uh, last spring, um, a few of the nature nerds, and um, I forgot they spell syrup with an I, which I guess is a more traditional spelling. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, I guess, you know, agricultural 
people of all types, whether they're growing corn and soybeans or tapping maple trees or at the mercy of the weather. And I, I don't know, it just seems like uh, seeing the sap flowing the way it is now would, would make me really nervous if this was uh, what my livelihood depended on. But um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. This, um, Folks, if you want to check this out, um, it's uh, Funks, F-U-N-K-S, Funks Pure Maple Syrup with an I dot com. Uh, you can check out uh, what they're up to um, and how they go about uh, their maple syrup production. All right. Um, oh, getting back to the squirrel, Valerie said that you had read that uh, there's a study that artificial lights outdoors increase squirrel mortality. The squirrels in the research area were active longer to the night, exposing them to more predators. Oh, well, that's an interesting place. I really have to try and look that one up. And Valerie is a big, um, uh, I was going to say advocate, uh, but that's not the right word. Uh, and uh, making people aware about the dangers of light pollution. Valerie spent a lot of time um, and effort to get the word out on the importance of, of keeping our dark skies at night. And um, I, I could see how, well, boy, you know, we did that, that OWL program back in November. I think I showed you some pictures from that. Um, and if not here, I can pull them up real quick. Um, the, uh, Um, the lights that they've put up at the boys' home next to Hickory Knolls are just insanely bright. Um, and I was wondering, you know, because there, there's really no cover um, when you're, uh, if there, you know, there's any animals that happen to live along that, that southern edge of our natural area. Um, the, I, I, I had the, I was wishing I had sunglasses on because it was so bright. Uh, so yeah, normally, you know, um, squirrels wouldn't have to worry about dealing with uh, owls because you know, the squirrels go to bed. <laughs> you know, they're not active at the same uh, time that the owls would be. And yet um, yeah, you, you add some artificial light and um, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Let's see if I can pull these up here. <laughs> well, maybe not. But yeah, I can see how that would happen, Valerie. And thanks for pointing that out because um, um, we're just, we make things too bright, much, much lighter than they have to be. One more slide. Here we go. Yeah, these, these pictures were so bright. Um, I kept thinking this was a daylight shot. Here, I'll share this. Um, So um, this was the, uh, how bright the lights were at the OWL program that we tried to do. Nope. <laughs> There's a stink horn. Look at that. Um, so yeah, I, you know, if there was a squirrel living, these are all, um, uh, there's uh, several oak trees bordering uh, the, this light area here. Um, you can see the shadow of the prison fence there, but um, especially if they're, uh, you know, working on their winter caches, um, I, I could see a daytime animal taking advantage of the bright uh, lights at night to get a little extra work done. And then, in fact, when we did this owl program, um, we were hearing a sound from the other side of the fence that uh, we're pretty sure was the uh, the begging calls of a uh, of a 
immature great horned owl still expecting mom and dad to bring it something um even though mom and dad are getting ready to you know start the next brood um and maybe you know if it had just come over to the other side of the fence it might have been able to find itself uh, a squirrel in the bright lights yeah that's just crazy how bright those lights are well thanks for bringing that up too valerie appreciate that um uh, lights in the blue white end of the spectrum will disturb all kinds of wildlife disrupts hunting courtship predation etc yeah and you know for as long as we've had um, the nature center there at Hickory Knolls right next to the boys home there's been talk of that facility closing now I would say five years ago or so they underwent an extensive renovation there which then you know, made it sound as though they were going to be using it quite a bit. But then I heard again recently that there's talk of uh, redoing the whole um, juvenile justice um, or uh, what is it, uh, Illinois Youth Corrections um, organization and, and consolidating. And once again, there was, was talk of closing uh, the St. Charles facility. I don't know what would become of that land if that uh, um, facility wasn't there anymore, but boy, I would sure like to see those lights go away. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty disturbing. Um, Anna Ralph, will lights disturb uh, owls and great blue herons? Yeah, I would I would imagine. Um, now the 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 herons are still nesting there. Um, and they, they, they were there again this year, but those lights, I don't know exactly when those lights went in. Um, they uh, had put some other white lights in um, probably around 2015, 2016. Um, we had just started doing star parties uh, where we were working with some local uh, amateur astronomers and they were setting up telescopes in, um, one of the soccer parking lots near where the dog park is. And um, we did a, a couple really cool full moon um, events with uh, big telescopes set up. And then we, we, when we plan the next one, when we, we, you know, we're setting up for it, all of a sudden, you know, somebody flipped a switch and these bright lights came on, but they weren't nearly as bright as these crazy bright ones that they have now. So, um, so the herons, you know, if, if those new lights were installed within the last year, they, the herons were definitely there this year. Uh, we'll see if they come back again, but that uh, could be uh, why we didn't have owls uh, nesting in that area. Um, Cause they, they have in the past uh, two or three different times, owls have nested in those heron, uh, and I suppose I should back up even more cause I didn't explain there's a, a heron rookery on the boys home side of uh, the fence there. And there's a, actually a large pond that was excavated by hand back in the 1920s. Uh, so the, um, the uh, boys that were living there could go fishing, go swimming, that sort of thing. So the, the herons moved in there in 2012 and have a rookery that goes between, uh, I think the smallest number of nests have been three and the most number of nests have been uh, seven. So it's not a huge rookery, but uh, we've also then two or three times we've had great horned owls that have nested in those heron nests that aren't being used in the winter time. Um, but yeah, we haven't seen an owl there now in a couple of years. So again, I don't know exactly when those insanely bright lights went in, but they you could be right in that it is causing the owls to go elsewhere. The herons, um, we'll see if they're back again this spring or not. Good point. We'll have to keep an eye on that. All right. Anything else that anybody has for the uh, good or the betterment of our group tonight? Uh, if not, I uh, greatly appreciate you tuning in and um, be doing it again next Tuesday night. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot more good nature to discuss. So appreciate your time, everybody. Um, have a great rest of your week and um, see you again soon. Take Thanks. care.
Thanks, Pam. Have a good night. Thank you, Pam. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Pam. Pam. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Pam. Good night.